I'm sorry. Uh, so welcome. Uh, today, I, I'm Charles Benator Santiago. I'm, I teach at the University of Connecticut. I have been asked to moderate this incredible panel, a really good panel, and um, on the uh, Puerto Rico status and plebiscite. Um, Edwin asked me to just give a brief overview of some of the if some of the structural questions that may come up in the panel, just to contextualize a little bit the debates. Uh, but just to give you a, a sense of what's going on is the United States was annexed in 1898, in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, and the United States invented a new territorial status that has since been known as the unincorporated territory. This is a status that belongs to the United States, as a territorial possession that belongs to the United States, but is not a part of the United States. It can be treated as a foreign place in a domestic or constitutional sense. This status was developed between 1899 and 1901 in a series of uh, policy initiatives by the military, by the Foraker Act, and affirmed by the Supreme Court in, some, in a series of cases known as the insular cases that began in 1901 and were essentially culminated by 1922, at least the core arguments. Uh, since then, the territorial status has been subject to debate. There was some debate at one point in the 1952, suggesting that there had been a territorial a change in the territorial status to a commonwealth, although the court seems to have rejected that argument uh, more recently this summer. Uh, but the question of resolving the status beyond a territorial, uh, unincorporated territorial status is still lingering. Since 1900, Congress has debated more than 131 status and legislation bills for Puerto Rico, but has never approved any status and legislation law to address the status of Puerto Rico. It came closer between 1989 and 1991. Uh, in Puerto Rico, there have been four plebiscites, or status plebiscites, maybe three and a half, depending <laughs> on how you treat the 1998 one. But in 1967, there was a status plebiscite uh, where the Commonwealth Party gained a majority. <coughs> then there was another plebiscite in 1993. Uh, I want to call it a half status plebiscite in 1998, which was primarily boycotted uh, with the FIFA column, none of the above, which won uh, as a protest vote. And then in 2012, we had another plebiscite. Uh, the subject to controversy because of the way that it was counted uh, or the way that it was measured. Um, as a result of the debates that ensued after the uh, 2012 status plebiscite, there were a series of hearings in the Senate and the House. Uh, in part of the 2014 budget, there was uh, an agreement to have a status education campaign and subsequent plebiscite. And there were an allocation of $2.5 million uh, in President Obama's budget, which are now being debated for implementation. Um, as soon as the new political party uh, took office, the statehood party in Puerto Rico, they, scheduled, they began to schedule a plebiscite, and the Senate passed legislation to schedule a plebiscite for June 11 of this year. Um, however, there have been some controversy because of the language and the options that have been offered for the plebiscite, uh, particularly from the Commonwealth or Partido Popular Democrático, which has been arguing for uh, the inclusion of a measure, of, uh, an alternative, measure that accurately describes their status. It's the free associated state. Um, on April 13th, if I remember correctly, the Department of Justice uh, sent a memorandum to the governor saying it would not approve the plebiscite unless there were some significant changes made to the language of the ballot. Uh, and, and, well, I should say would not approve, would not authorize or recommend, uh, particularly the release of $2.5 million that would go towards the $7 million plebiscite. Uh, the Department of Justice has not approved the language of the revised ballot yet. Uh, there is some suspicion that it will approve it at the last minute. The current government has decided to go forward and schedule the plebiscite. In the meantime, uh, the two major political parties, or uh, two alternative parties, the Independence Party and the Commonwealth Party, Partido Popular, have decided to publicly boycott the plebiscite. Uh, <laughs> so right now, we're having a conversation about a potential plebiscite in June 11. Uh, and we've decided to invite some really interesting panels to give us their insights or perspectives on the status plebiscite from both the historical and the contemporary. Uh, and I'd like to begin with Rafael Cox Salomar, who's a professor at the uh, University of the District of Columbia, the David uh, 
Clark School of Law. And I may say, also a former candidate for, as resident commissioner for the Partido Popular Democrático. Uh, He's like ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> but someone who's had political experience and who understands cómo se bata el cobre in these debates. Uh, afterwards, we will have Martin Perez, uh, who's the founder of the Latino Leadership Alliance in New Jersey. And then Lydia Valencia, Chief Executive Officer for the Puerto Rican Congress of New Jersey. Um, the, I, think, I think what makes sense, given the short amount of time, is that we allow the panelists to speak. And then I'll moderate some questions. Uh, I'm fairly flexible, but I want to give people 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Yes, yeah. Can we say 10 minutes? Straight, yeah, and if you need more, we'll yeah, take it. I'll just go straight to the point. Can Please. I just uh, yes. ask a question? I'm sorry it came in a few minutes no. late. Can I have your name? Because your name wasn't, uh, was it in the I'm the moderator. Oh, okay. Charles Santiago. Thank you very much. No problem. Hey, Charlie, thank you so much. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored, I mean, I'm honored to be here. I'm uh, honored to have Arcadia Quiñone here with us as well. So anyway, I'm going to take it just where uh, Charlie just left it off. Uh, first of all, uh, when we say the Department of Justice of the U.S. needs to approve the ballot, approval in this case doesn't mean approval for making this a binding plebiscite. It's just approval for dispersing funds that have been appropriated right, by Congress to actually uh, finance aspects of the administration of this local plebiscite. But fundamentally, this plebiscite, as all other plebiscites before it, is a non-binding exercise. It really doesn't bind at all Congress to do anything regarding Puerto Rico's decolonization. Okay? So that's the first takeaway. So if you have to take away anything from this a conference, well, the takeaway is this plebiscite is just as the 1967, 1993, 1998, and 2012. I mean, there's no commitment on Congress's part to basically act upon the will of the people of Puerto Rico, okay? So this is yet another local exercise. Local exercise designed, in a way, to fire up the political base of the pro-statehood party, right? And it's a political campaign promise, right? And somehow it's a way of actually firing up the base, right? I believe it's the wrong, the wrong mechanism. I believe that the people of Puerto Rico should actually convene a constitutional convention, a status assembly, right? Out of our own volition, and then press the political branches in Washington, Washington internationally, to actually define with specificity the meds and bounds of the various political alternatives that we have before us. Right. The second point I want to raise is that, and the second takeaway I want you guys to basically digest today is that there's no environment in Washington in favor of statehood that if you look at the letter that was sent to the governor of Puerto Rico on April 12th, on April 13th, you're gonna realize, one, that the Department of Justice's requirement that the plebiscite ballot include the current territorial status is just a maneuver, right, to somehow prevent a majority vote in favor of state. Uh, second of all, and, and it's just something that's uh, mind-boggling. There you have Jeff Sessions, okay? The, uh, the super Republican Attorney General of Donald Trump in that letter saying, okay, that the US citizenship of Puerto Ricans under Commonwealth status is of the same constitutional magnitude that the US, U.S. citizenship of folks living on the mainland. In other words, the folks who are actually xenophobic and they really want to have this wall built to basically separate the U.S. from Mexico, the folks who are hunting out Latino immigrants in the U.S., they're so desperate against a statehood petition that they're willing to actually use the citizenship status in a different way just to say that you don't even need to petition statehood. You can actually keep your citizenship 
while at the same time being a colony, being a territory. So mm -hmm. that goes to show as well the anti-statehood feeling, right, that basically percolates Washington nowadays. So that's the second point I want to raise. Now, the third point I want to raise, and I guess a third takeaway I want you guys to take away with you is the political status of Puerto Rico is a fundamentally is a political, it's a public policy issue, it's not a legal issue. What does that mean? Different from what some folks believe, the political status of the island will not be solved in a court of law. There is no obstacle pursuant to the U.S. Constitution for the U.S. to develop the relationship it wants with Puerto Rico. The problem is that as things stand right now in the post-Cold War world, it seems as if the choices available to Puerto Rico are but two. Maintaining the colonial relationship in perpetuity or moving towards sovereignty. Statehood is not in the cards, and an enhanced commonwealth premised on the basis of a bilateral pact that's basically unalterable without the consent of both parties is not available either. So the real options that Puerto Rico faces are either remains as a colony forever under the territorial clause or, or moves to sovereignty either as a free associated state in the mold of perhaps Greenland or the Cook Islands or Western Samoa under the British uh, Commonwealth uh, or other examples from the world, or moves to <coughs> unencumbered independence. I mean, I think those are the options for Puerto Rico as things stand right now. Now, <coughs> the fourth point I want you guys to realize is that in the promesa, in the post promesa world, the whole Puerto Rico county <coughs> paradigm is just finished. And promesa, and the, and the upside of promesa, the upside of promesa is that the cat is out of the bag, right? The whole discourse that we witnessed during the 50s and 60s that some of Puerto Rico had achieved a new dimension of federalism, that somehow Puerto Rico <coughs> had achieved a self-governing status and the lofty con concepts that were basically presented before the United Nations in the 50s, all, these things came, all those things came down rushing to the ground, and the US has no qualms at actually admitting to the world that Puerto Rico is a non-self-governing jurisdiction, because after all, under PROMESA, you have a fiscal control board that has plenary authority over Puerto Rico without Puerto Rico's consent. And the Supreme Court of the US and the Congress basically at no point have shied away from denying this reality. Now, uh, the fifth point I want you guys to realize is that the fifth and last point I want you guys to realize, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues and then we'll open up the whole a scenario for questions and debates is that we have a big responsibility, okay? It's not just the US. I mean, it's very easy, obviously, to complain, to basically uh, place all the responsibility on someone else's shoulders, okay? But us, Puerto Ricans, right? the people of Puerto Rico, we have a huge responsibility to fight for our own decolonization. And in so doing, we need to put an end to what I believe has been an asymmetrical bilateral dialogue between us and the US. Somehow I believe that that dialogue should be triangulated. And somehow I believe that Puerto Rico should be put back on the list of UN colonies, that the United Nations and that we should actually push for, and I know that in the Trump world this might sound a bit uh, Gullible, but I believe that we should actually open the door, as has been opened in the context of the British and French possessions in the Caribbean and the Pacific in the, in the last couple of years, we should actually open the door for the United Nations and other international organizations to get involved in this dialogue with the political branches in Washington and somehow triangulate this whole discussion, in other words, to bring along to the table other uh, stakeholders that might actually balance the forces because as things stand right now, Puerto Rico is gonna end up a colony forever with no economic future in sight because the fiscal control board actually responds to Congress, doesn't respond to the people of Puerto Rico and that's not gonna change. 
no matter how many protests, no, many, no matter how many marches. So we need to look at the political dimension to this whole dilemma. And to finish up, uh, as I witnessed and I actually heard my colleagues at the plenary session, I mean, they were heavily involved in the fiscal crisis situation. But there's a pink elephant in the room. And the pink elephant in the room is the undeniable fact that Puerto Rico remains subject to the plenary authority of Congress. So, you know, when we talk about Title III of PROMESA, and we say, well, the board then is the one that certifies. I mean, the board certifies everything. I mean, fundamentally, the board has basically nullified the Constitution of Puerto Rico. There's no fiscal autonomy anymore in Puerto Rico. That was the only thing we had left. And we don't even have that anymore. And that has to do with the political dimension to the crisis. Now, Dennis, for instance, I'm going to just uh, pass it on to my colleagues now. You know, the adjective that this is a complicated moment, fine, it's complicated. But this is a transformative moment. Not just complicated moment, because I don't want you to, to, to leave this conference in a, in a gloomy mood. I want you to realize that this is a transformative moment, because for the first time, somehow, the whole situation looks clearer now. It's more, much harder now for folks to say that Puerto Rico is not, not a colony. Only not the Colombian list, right? <laughs> That's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the parting of the ways and the fact that folks finally will have to face a, a stark choice. Either we stay a colony forever or we move to sovereignty. I mean, because statehood, as things that stand right now, is not an option. Well, uh, good morning, every, every, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. Uh, this situation of Puerto Rico is uh, it's been developed since uh, uh, General Miles came to Puerto Rico and told us that he was bringing the advantage and blessings uh, of, enlight of an enlightened civilization. The thing is that they promise us that, uh, assuming that we didn't know anything about anything. And they stick us in the territorial clause. And was the governance that developed through the process of the uh, Foraker Law, John's Law, and the, uh, uh, the uh, ELA, uh, is, is a, is not an, a, a relationship of equality. So, is we have, they gave us the, the, the American citizens, but he's a second class citizen. So what will happen now is that we can figure out that all these times, that even when United States decided that, that say that in the nation, United Nations, that because we passed the Constitution of the ELA, we now we were not a colony. Finally, they accepted that we are a colony, and the, the, the executive power, the Supreme Court, and the, <laughs> the legislative body have said that we are colony. That we 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 still stay in the territorial clause, and the sovereign of Puerto Rico is not in Puerto Rico; is in United in, in the Congress. The, we don't have. A chief of state. The chief of state of Puerto Rico is uh, Donald Trump. So the reason why uh, all these uh, plebiscites has been done in the past is because they want to show in the international law that, that uh, the people of Puerto Rico agree with the status that we have. Thing is that uh, in the first uh, three or four uh, Plebiscites, the, the, the people supported the ELA, uh, Estado Libre Asociado, won those plebiscites. They keep saying, well, <coughs> people agree with the status that we have. The thing is that in, in, uh, in, in 2012, the prosecute people won the election, won the, 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 the plebiscite. The problem is that in, this, in that election, uh, uh, the results were not that clear because the people, the prostatehood people, uh, got 834 votes, the, the free association 454, 
the independence, 74,000. <coughs> and there was 515,000 uh, people who voted in black. So the people that uh, supported free association, the independence, and the people who voted in black were more than the people who supported the people who won the election, the, the plebiscite. So the government of the United States said, this is not clear. So, it, so they passed a, a, a budgetary bill that put two, two, two million and a half dollars to allow Puerto Rico to, to do whenever they decide to do a, another place beside, to see if we're more clear. Uh, the problem is that, uh, tied with that, is that the United States, the, 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 the Department of Justice, supposed to approve the ballot. In the, uh, uh, if not, they will not be able to release the money. So uh, when the process just sent the ballot, the the Department of Justice, as he said, said no. This is not because it doesn't include the present status, the territorial status. They have to, they have to be there in order for us to approve. And so, uh, Rosa, you sent a letter saying, well, uh, we are willing to include the, the, the territorial status, the present status, but you have to answer us soon because it's not we want to be able to do it. Uh, we need the money. So uh, when they, they still have not approved the money, Rosselló, the governor of Puerto Rico said that they're going to do the, the, the pledge to decide anyway. The thing is that in this, that process, the independent party that used to support the, the, the pledge to decide, <coughs> the, the people, the sovereignistas, used to support the, the plebiscite, and in June, decide, no, now we are not willing to support because we are not willing to support an uh, option of the present status because there is a consensus in Puerto Rico for the first time in history that the independentistas, the pro statehood and the, the sovereignistas agree that Puerto Rico is a colony and the present status is not acceptable, that we have to change. So, for that reason, I think that, and because of the crisis, fiscal crisis, uh, financial crisis that we have in Puerto Rico, I think that, uh, like my mother used to say, entre más hinchado, mejor para curar. Okay? Because the situation that we have now, we're gonna have to deal with the relationship with the United States uh, and Puerto Rico. I think that the alternative that we have to now is to follow the proposal of the, uh, the Colegio de Abogados de Puerto Rico, which is the, uh, the, the, the Asamblea de Status, which will allow us to present another plebiscite to Puerto Rico in which we present a, a, a way, a process to create a, a, another negotiation to discuss the present status de Puerto Rico, de, de la Constitución de Lela, y, and the, the process of decolonization. If, if we can do that, uh, we might be able to, say, to get out of the situation. But for that, we need unity. And for, uh, in that process, we're gonna have to be able to, to agree the, the political, uh, Paris and the civil society, the unions, the students, the women, and all, all, every, all uh, a, a transversal cut of the uh, Puerto Rican society had to uh, get, get involved. Uh, what the, the Bars Association proposes is, is as an assembly, a, a status as assembly in which we're gonna elect uh, uh, 75, I think it's 70 or, or 70 um, el uh, elected members of the, that assembly that we will discuss the situation of, of, of Puerto Rico and create una, a proposal to United States to negotiate that <coughs> situation. This is gonna be complex because the, the PNP right now, they think that they can solve the problem themselves. And it's not going to happen because 
this situation of Puerto Rico cannot be solved under the context of the political parties. A pa a poli and only one political party cannot solve because the United States it will not uh, support it. We're going to have to create a consensus in Puerto Rico and negotiate in order to, to get out of that situation. Um, the only thing that I wanted to add to that is that because we are in this, this particular situation in which we have now five million of Puerto Ricans in the United States and three in Puerto Rico, that process of decolonization cannot happen without us. We are us. If we create a, a, an assembly, status assembly in Puerto Rico, we have to find a way in which the diaspora participate in that process in an, an equal basis. And, and that's the gonna be, we're gonna have to negotiate in that process, not just with the, the uh, PMPs, but also with the independentistas and sovereignistas, because some of the people in Puerto Rico don't think that we have equality in that situation of being Puerto Ricans. Sometimes they use for us for particular purpose, but sometimes they think that we are not as Puerto Ricans as the people in Puerto Rico. So we have to create, a, a, it's important that the people in the diaspora, we create an, an, an uh, organization and of various, of various organizations in which create a, a force in the United States. Why is that? Because if Puerto Rico, all the parties in Puerto Rico and civil society agree in a proposal, the people who can really make a stick it's five, uh, four or five millions of votes in the United States. We're going to be able to uh, force uh, the, the government of the United States to support that process that we support in Puerto Rico. And that's, what, that's, that's the important things of organizing the diaspora. And that's a unique, uh, unique uh, situation in, in, in the world because I don't know many people who are in the, this process of decolonization, and the, most of the people are in the uh, outside the, the, the country. <coughs> it's it very uh, very interesting, but we have to uh, to be able to to deal with each other and deal with the unity. We're going to have to respect each other uh, because uh, the problem is that sometimes the independentistas and the uh, and the uh, Lo, lo, la gente que de, de support the statehood don't want to talk. Don't respect each other. <coughs> We're going to have to respect each other and come together and, and, and understand that the unity is not about agreeing and everything. It's the contrary. It's be able to uh, have different opinions, but be able to get together to advance a particular uh, agenda. Well, I guess it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> I'm Lydia Valencia. Thank you for having me here. Um, I think that the two gentlemen before me, preceding me, uh, gave a very good historical perspective uh, as to where we are at now and why we might be where we are. Um, and the actuality is that the situation in Puerto Rico now necessitates for us to stop thinking with our hearts and start thinking with our heads. Um, and, and I know that that's a very uh, challenging position to take because uh, everyone is very passionate about the island and its people and our own ideologies. Uh, perhaps I, I believe that that is what drove uh, Governor Luis Munoz Marin to return to the island in the 50s and uh, help establish what we knew as the Commonwealth in Puerto Rico. Um, we all know that in actuality he was an independentista, uh, but he negotiated that uh, status uh, that is now so controversial and such a problematic situation for us presently. To add all of that, um, we're now confronted with a chaotic situation in Puerto Rico. It, it, it is chaos. Uh, uh, and I, I realize that passions run deep and protests are, are going on and civil disobedience is a guaranteed uh, right of every citizen in a democracy. 
uh, but sometimes protests are not going to solve the problem. Yes, it calls attention to the problem, but at present, we don't need to be hamakiado. <laughs> we know, we know we're in a bad spot. Um, and there are some realities that we must face uh, when we have a problem and a challenge and uh, confrontations. And that, some of those realities is promesa is law. I mean, there is no way we're going to go around promesa at this point in time. Uh, the Fiscal Control Board is part of that law. There's not much we can do about that at present time. Um, Puerto Rico is broke, but it's not broken yet. Uh, and that, I think, uh, bears a lot to say, uh, given the situation in Puerto Rico, that uh, we have not fallen apart. Uh, and I, I believe that what Martin said is very true. We need to come together. We need to start the dialogue on how we're going to address the problem of Puerto Rico. Uh, the dialogue could lead to a lot of things, uh, but at least we start talking. Um, corruption, mismanagement, misspending uh, have created the dilemma that we're in uh, financially, economically, uh, and many administrations have shared blame in this. So it is not any one administration, it's been many, and that's been unfortunate, but it is a reality. Uh, the infrastructure is crumbly, our educational system is in disarray, our health system is almost nil, lack of parity of Medicaid fan funding and to boot natural disasters such as Sika affect. Economy, what economy? There is no economy in Puerto Rico right now, not our own. The mass exodus of our people uh, is another dilemma. Uh, dilemma because uh, uh, historically we have not allowed the di diaspora to be part of the conversation. And again, I agree with Martin. The diaspora plays a very vital role at this point in time. And we've been, always been uh, ready and available, but we've always been barred. <laughs> And not by just one party, but by, by many. Promesa, what, well, the question is what can we do? Uh, Promesa, we need to maintain a close eye on the control board so that they abide by the laws set forth in Promesa. And be ready to address any missteps immediately. Uh, let's not talk about whether they're going to. Let's take the uh, proactive role of keeping an eye on them and making sure that we call them, uh, call them up on their uh, missteps if there are any. Uh, and I'm sure that they might be. <laughs> uh, Medicaid funding. We can strongly, the diaspora, can strongly lobby our congressional de delegations in our states to seek equality and parity in funding for the island, to lift the cap as well. I think the diaspora has been at fault of not being as proactive in doing the lobbying uh, that we need to, to do for Puerto Rico. Uh, and I think if we get the mindset that we have the power to call our congressional delegations and insist that they meet, at least meet with us, and we put some things on the table. Uh, there are well over five million of us stateside. So we're, we're a force to contend with. Um, the plebiscite, I realize that there is much talk about boycotting this initiative, and I can understand the passion. But rather than boycotting, I firmly believe that we should be organizing and ensuring that any, everyone eligible to vote and would ultimately be impacted by the results gets the opportunity to vote. At minimum, the di diaspora would have a direction position to address the status. I, I share the thought of uh, my other uh, panelists here in that there is no will in Congress to really address our issue because we've never had the force by which to sit with a collective position by the people, for the people to present. Some of us go one way and the others go another and they are very happy to say, yo me limpio la mano, porque they can't come together and know what they're asking for. 
uh, we need to stop the bickering, we need to stop pointing fingers, and we need to get to work. The diaspora has a vital role, as I said before, but we need a mandate, we need some direction, and I think the plebiscite is the venue by which we would be able to ascertain what the people on the island who are the ones that are most seriously affected by the situation in Puerto Rico want us to do as far as the diaspora is concerned. And I agree it is a transformative moment. I, agree, I disagree that statehood is not an option. It could be an option uh, should the people decide that that's the choice that they want. I agree. Okay. Uh, I think that we need to put it on the table, let it take its course, and let's then get together and fight for our island. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let me take the privilege as a moderator to add two more comments, and then we'll have a conversation. Uh, one of the comments that, I, that, I, that hasn't been discussed, but I think it's really important to consider in this discussion of, for example, statehood, is that electoral data that's available shows that Puerto Ricans in primaries in Puerto Rico tend to vote two to one for the Democratic Party. And in the United States, electoral data suggests that Puerto Ricans in the mainland vote Democrat and not Republican. Granting Puerto Rico statehood or considering that possibility would mean, based on mm -hmm. apportionment levels, giving the Democratic Party anywhere from two senators to four to five legislators, depending on the population migration shifts, because the way that the uh, general uh, <coughs> Congress is apportioned uh, is based on population. Puerto Rico has a similar population to Connecticut but we'll see what happens with migration. But we're talking about potentially giving the Democratic Party seven uh, seats. Uh, and that raises a lot of red flags for a Republican-controlled Senate and House and uh, presidency. Uh, in addition to that, there are other implications that, ha that uh, follow from perceptions of Puerto Rico and constituents in Congress and so on and so forth and maintaining a balance in the Senate and the Congress. But I, I want to add that just to contextualize some of the debate. I'd like to, uh, for the sake of transparency, uh, to clarify, I pro I'm probably the elephant in the room. <laughs> I am a Republican, but I've always said, I've always said, <laughs> well, I have a shared, okay. I have a shared, um, I have always said that I'm Boricua first and Republican second. Uh, so therefore, uh, I, know the dynamics of what would occur in Puerto Rico. I'm willing to say that it's only fair. If that's what Puerto Ricans on the island and those that have a vested interest, again, I share your uh, thoughts on that, that all of those, and I think the way to address that is all of those that have a vested interest on the island that might live on the mainland should have the right to vote in any decision-making process that would take place. Yeah. I, ju I just want to make a comment, because the only thing that I have uh, disagree with, with uh, Lydia is when she said that there was not an economy in Puerto Rico. I think that this economy is, is very strong, because I, I spent two, two weeks uh, doing the Christmas in Puerto Rico, and I used to go to those malls and I couldn't find a parking. And I said, this is a crisis, but uh, there's no parking in the malls. And people have spending, uh, spending a lot of money. I think that there was a crisis of the government, yes. but it's not a necessary crisis of the economy. The economy, it might be strong, but the government is weak, and we don't have, a, we have a fiscal crisis. And I think that Eventually, I think there could be a crisis in the economy, and it's going to happen soon. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, we are stronger than, than we think. The other thing that we, I want to sh share to you is that I, I think that if we create that status of, uh, of constitution, status constitutional assembly, we're going to have to deal with the fact that if we elect uh, that assembly, those, that assembly it will be effective if the the statehood people are involved, and the, uh, the uh, sovereign people are involved, and the uh, people who support the independence. And we have to agree that if, pe if the consensus and the government and the people of Puerto Rico support the statehood, we might have to uh, take a, a shot at it. 
The thing is that, and, and we have to uh, commit to that, mm -hmm. but, but if, if uh, it doesn't work, we have to understand that if you make a proposal of marriage to somebody and the person t tells you that I don't want to marry you because you are broke or because the color of your skin, you're going to have to move forward. And that has to be the commitment of everybody in that process. So I have one, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. OK. Nine. OK. So I, I guess I get privilege. So <laughs> <laughs> I put you number two, but that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> It's a couple of comments, right? The first one is that you both are right, my two friends from New Jersey. Puerto Rico is actually two different comments. One for the poor, one for the rest. And, and that's the reality that not escape. When people go to Plaza Amarga, I always see the same thing from Puerto Rico. Thank you for Puerto Thank you. Yeah, because you don't go to the places that the rest of them go to, to the projects, to, you know, inside the island and so forth. So that's the, the reality of this. You know, Sixty percent of children are in, in poverty. How can you say that Puerto Rico is broke? But it has those two realities, right? The private sector is doing a little bit <coughs> of growth. So I just want to say, you know, so as an economist, uh, you know, uh, it will take a long haul to repair that. But the, on, uh, I don't want to comment on the uh, lack of people yet. But I think it would be a great, a great commitment if people were agreed to the but there's no incentive for the, uh, the pro-state forces to actually go through that process. Why? They have, you know, they have a growing majority, they, they are in government, and so forth and so on. But what I do like about La Santa Constituyente is that it establishes a mechanism where you really are going to exclude the extreme right and the extreme left. Because the, for Puerto Rico, there are a lot of people that only accept either independence or state. Right? And what I'm saying is, if you accept the, the premise that we need to be all in agreement, that whatever wins, wins, and that we're going to move forward with that formula, if you are in the Benedicta, you have to agree that state is a valid option. That, that was not a so, so and for me, that, that's the core of the Assemblea Constituyente, that in Puerto Rico there is an intolerance to political formulas. So if you're independent, please accept the possibility of failure and vice versa. But there are some extremes in the political discourse in Puerto Rico and here in the diaspora that will never agree to the principle of tolerance and, and recognizing other people. So people will argue, oh, we're confused, or oh, other people will argue this, interest, whatever. But the fact is that that's the merit of the Assemblea Constituyente, I think. I never said never, because we could always. <laughs> I have one hand over. Let me do a time check here. It's 12.24. Oh, okay. Uh, I have two, three, uh, three, four, five. That's good. Yep. Can people try to, with all due respect, ask questions? My question will be with the clarification of those who was born here. What she mentioned about Puerto Ricans here to vote. Is this for those who were born in the island with a certificate, birth certificate that states Puerto Rico? Or mine that says the United States. Because right. that'll open up a can that others of this land could vote. Mm -hmm. Can we take one of the questions first and then? Why don't we do that? Yeah. So let me get one, so two, three. I just need I the clarity okay, can you, on that question. I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay. I'm a U.S. born person. Right. So am I. Right. Do we vote for this plebiscite or not? Because if that gives us the right. How about the non Puerto Ricans who are U.S. born like us? You're talking about status, uh, the constitutional plebiscite. assembly? No, no, the plebiscite. The plebiscite yeah. on June. Well, I, I had. Let, let, let me oh, just, let me just grab all the questions here. Okay. Uh, two, three, four, five. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me get grab all we're, the questions. We're going to take the questions we're... first, and then we're going to answer. Two, three, four, five. Okay. Next. This is my concern. Uh, the whole uh, 
bubble that statehood has been put in uh, over the decades, you know, as uh, as a viable option, uh, was not brought up by the Washingtons and Hamilton and Jeffersons of this country, you know. Uh, my question is, if Puerto Rico becomes a state from a country where elections are bought by the top easily 2%, what is it to stop the people from the north to go down there and buy those positions and take over our island for themselves? Because that's democracy, isn't it? Let me get the next question here. That's the question. Okay. I have a preamble, but there's a question, okay? <laughs> now, just, just bear with me. Puerto Rico invented identity politics. We define ourselves, well, most of us do. I personally don't, as, you know, I am for statehood. I am for commonwealth. I am for independence. That is for I am. That is divorce from our conception of what we want in a government or what we want in terms of economic policy, okay? So what being one has nothing to do with governance and economic issues. Now, the reason why people vote identify is very emotional, but there's also the concern of, I think I will do better in financially under statehood. I think I will do, you know, it's, there's an economic compromise and so forth. So when you all discuss the things, it's tied to this identity that's somewhat conventionally tied to practical matters such as the economy. Why hasn't anybody, instead of advocating a status, percent under statehood, this is our economic outlook. Under Commonwealth, this is our economic outlook. And with all due respect, the Independence Party, which has been up for like 100 years, what is their economic you know, policy? Because I, I'm not even aware that they have something that I can, you know. So, and, and how about taking an economic approach towards defining our status rather than ruling with our hearts and a sense of self that may be tied to whether we were born in Aguadilla or whether our mother was foreign born. And you know, and that will be enough to send you in one direction or the other, you know, in terms of identity. <coughs> have one, two. Okay. Yeah. My question is when people argue Puerto Rico a colony or a territory. Uh, many believe it's a colony, but I do because you, and a lot of people say, no, we're not a colony. A lot of Puerto Ricans say, we're a territory. So what is it? Okay. Yes. That's it. Uh, a short uh, preamble. And, uh, <laughs> uh, well, the preamble is just to agree. Uh, I was pleased to, to hear uh, most of you uh, that, that the diaspora indeed has to play a very important role. And it's already playing a very important role uh, in the future of Puerto Rico. And uh, that all political parties have been used to deal with that in the island. Mm. And here too, not just in mm -hmm. Indiana, but in Congress too. Huh? What, uh, what does that mean? And, and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, I am particularly concerned with the destructive character of uh, PROMESA, Junta, uh, Congress right now. And a proof of that is the Universidad de Puerto Rico and public education. Just an example, but a very dramatic example. Many of the Puerto Ricans in the diaspora come from the schools in Puerto Rico and from the Universidad de Puerto Rico. That, let's keep that in mind, just as an example of how destructive, not just the Commonwealth has plummeted, but also the fear of public education in Puerto Rico. As Stiglitz said, this is terrible for any future of the island. Thought, intellectual uh, production, and thought. And then my question has to do with um, uh, one of the comments of uh, Cox Alomar. Uh, Cox said, political status is not a legal issue. It is more of a policy issue. And I think, uh, I take that uh, very seriously in the sense that uh, any position supporting the plebiscite as it is uh, does not take into consideration the history, the colonial history. Colonial history teaches us really that Congress, 
never lets go entirely. And I think this plebiscite is also another game, another possibility for uh, losing even more of our dignity. And I use that word very deliberately because dignity is a political, it's a philosophical, it's an important word in democracy as well. It's not just rhetoric, and it's not just nationalist rhetoric. I think we have to keep that in mind. So my question has to do uh, going back to that statement by Cox Alomar, it is not only a legal issue, it is also a policy issue, meaning that Congress has been playing games uh, since 1898. And it's naive to think that it's still not going to play games. Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. So I have the last two questions, and then we'll do a quick round. Who does? So like there are multiple academies, there are multiple diasporas. Los, mi mamá, her diasporic experience is very different from someone my age coming to Puerto Rico. And given that, how will that affect plebiscite conversation stateside? <laughs> okay, <laughs> last question. Um, not getting into too much of a point, but disagreeing with the concept that it was, what goes on in Puerto Rico is bickering. I have to tell you, I, sometimes it bothers me when people look at what goes on on the island and like start making fun of what goes on because they don't understand it. It's not bigger. People, anyway, but the point is, what is it if the idea is for, for the island to decide with, with that in the diaspora? I, I firmly believe, being a New York City boy, you got to put it in the diaspora. But what is it that you need to do to transcend whatever it is that needs to be transcended so that people will get together and say, I'm buying into a system that's not statehood, party, and that's not popular Democratic Party, but this is my process that I'm buying into. What do I have to do to make that happen? Stop here. Okay. Do, how do we want to go? He is the politician, really. <laughs> uh, on your question, and I know that we had questions beforehand, but on your question, I, I think that the buy-in uh, really has to start on the political level uh, because they're the ones that issue the, the discourse. Uh, so I think that once the political parties, all of them, uh, finally, if ever, <laughs> uh, decide that one, the diaspora has a role, two, that they have to and should sit down and dialogue in order to resolve the issue. I mean, whatever it may be. Um, uh, it could be that by some miracle of chance where numbers have not demonstrated independence, it could be that. But we should all understand that we need to sit down and resolve this issue. Because if not, we're going to lose the island. In regards to uh, buying the island, I believe somebody said that, Unfortunately, there are strangers out there already buying our island. We're losing our island bit by bit by bit by bit by investors that have come in and taken advantage of the incentives that are being offered. So we're losing our island whether we like it or not. So are we going to wait until we don't have an island to defend? It's up to us. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I, I just recently, a year and a half ago, bought a house in Puerto Rico. The Doral Bank was in bankruptcy, and I figured out that they must have a, 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 you know, a lot of properties in bankruptcy, uh, and they're going to do something with it. I, I called the, the, the uh, wash, um, wash in California, where the people uh, who control those properties were, and they told me that it was going to be a, a, an auction in a San Juan Hotel. So I went, and I called the, the guy, it was a Mexican who was handling that, and he told me, yeah, I told him, oh yeah, I'm going to be there in, in Puerto Rico. So you want to go? Go there. So well, can you send me the, the, the list of property? So I, I, I went there, he sent me the property, figured out, I... I make a, a, a proposal to and a property, and I got it, an apartment. But 
I said, I'm going to go anyway to, to the option. And, the, and, the, uh, uh, and I went there to the Hotel San Juan, and most of the people there were, in, for the big properties, were uh, foreigners. Foreigners. And I think that it's important that we, uh, we have a crisis, whatever you say, but there's, there's people with a plan for Puerto Rico. And there's, there, it's in the process, it's in the process. The people are going to buy a lot of the island, and we're going to lose control of the island unless we make a plan. And that's why it's so important, the, the diaspora, because the diaspora is here. A lot of people have worked for a long time. They have saved some money, and I say the diaspora, go, go to Puerto Rico, buy a piece of property, because poor, uh, God made only 100 by 35 uh, miles for Puerto Rico, and after he made that, he rested, and he's not going to make any more land. <laughs> so we had to go there and, and buy it, so to keep it in Puerto Ricans. And I think that it's important, the organization of the diaspora, but the issue is how we can unite. And the, uni the unity in the diaspora, it's not only about the independentistas, the pro stakeholders, and the pro uh, free association, but also the people who are uh, uh, Democrats and, and Republicans. We have to come together. We have to come together because it's our responsibility for the, for the future of our country and the future of our children. Let me uh, just wrap up. Uh, the first, the first comment I'm going to react to is to Lydia's Lydia's comment. Obviously, statehood in theory is an option. Obviously, even the United Nations, right, since the 1960s, has recognized integration as an option towards decolonization. But from a practical perspective, pursuant to the constitutional model of the U.S. Statehood is a concession Congress makes on the basis of conditions Congress comes up with. It has done so on 37 occasions. It's not a right. So in other words, in terms of practicality and reality, there's some big time hurdles Puerto Rico has to go through if it wants to be a viable candidate for statehood. I mean, at no point in the USS history since 1791 has a broken territory been accepted to statehood. I mean, there's some realities. If you guys do research and go back to the Senate reports in 1958-59 on the Hawaii and Alaska statehood bills, you're going to see that Alaska had a booming economy, Hawaii had a booming economy. I mean, they have been paying, I mean, it, it was a different trajectory. So obviously, in terms of theory, fantastic. Yes, if the people of Puerto Rico actually choose statehood, right, and the U.S. Congress actually admits Puerto Rico, then even if some of us would actually oppose that, so be it. Let the majority prevail, obviously. I mean, that's the, I mean there, there can be no doubt about that. Uh, so basically, on that point, I think <coughs> we actually reach a consensus on this table. The second point I want to address is Edwin's point, I host, um, on, on, uh, with, with regards to the uh, Constitutional Assembly. Whether the statehood movement will, at some point, actually accede to participate of a constitutional convention that will actually depend on how we define and how we actually establish the met and bounds of the constitutional convention. So one of the one of the more ingenious and more creative ideas on how to deal with this is actually to have a non-confrontational convention. In other words, a convention where you have equal number of delegates, all the political forces go to Washington and they negotiate the respective definitions of each of those formulas without outside interventions or tor torpedoing from each other. I mean, it's, it's obviously a tough endeavor, but it obviously depends on how you design it. I mean, there are ways in which they could feel comfortable enough to participate in, and if they believe they have an overwhelming majority, they're gonna win, obviously, in the end, mm -hmm. right? The supportive Puerto Rican electorate, and you know, they should be they should feel safe, they should have some confidence in the process. So I believe that, uh, I mean, they should not oppose the convention uh, as a matter of uh, principle. Now, with regards to Mr. Rodriguez, he raises the question of the uh, 
you know, he's concerned with the fact that folks could go into Puerto Rico <coughs> on the statehood model and basically, quote unquote, I might paraphrase, to purchase, right, seats, etc. Well, you know, obviously Puerto Rico become a state, then Puerto Rico is bound by the uniformity clause of the U.S. Constitution. That means that Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico residency requirements for participation in electoral processes, they need to comply and comport with the privileges and immunities clause and with the uniformity clause. So Puerto Rico has to behave as any other state, right? Puerto Rico would not be able to come up with any other different law regulation, right? than that other state can actually do. So in a way, in that sense, statehood is a straitjacket, right? And you know, obviously law enforcement will deal with folks who attempt to actually purchase seats or be corrupt or what have you. Now, in terms of Mr. Prats, I mean, he's asking questions having to do with residency requirements for the upcoming play site. As things stand right now, the applicable law in terms of residency requirements for the upcoming play site is our current law. The current electoral law for Puerto Rico requires, I believe, a one-year residency in Puerto Rico before someone can actually go and vote in a local event. I mean, if in the future we have a binding plebiscite or a binding process, right, and we have Congress on the table, perhaps we could negotiate for the diaspora, right, to vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, last weekend, the French elected Emmanuel mm -hmm. Macron as president, and the French were voting around the world. Even the mm -hmm. folks in the mm -hmm. French Polynesia, even the folks in New Caledonia in the Pacific exactly. were voting, mm -hmm. yeah. right? They're not colonies. They're ultramar. They're I'll get to Ms. Sierra Sorita in a second. <laughs> uh, so, actually, and then uh, Mrs. Sierra Sorita raises uh, the identity politics question. It's a great question. And I guess the answer to the question is that since we haven't been able, since 1898, to actually sit down with Congress, defining with specificity the mets and bolts of any political formula, you know, we, we are at, in the realm of pure speculation in actually knowing the specificity of the economic model of any of these formulas because this is just window shopping. I mean, we really don't know what Congress <coughs> is willing to do in terms of Puerto Rico. I mean, obviously we know that under statehood, pursuant to the uniformity clause, we wouldn't have fiscal autonomy. But we have lost our fiscal autonomy with this crisis anyway. Mm -hmm. But we do not know the transition requirements. Congress would actually impinge on the people of Puerto Rico moving forward, right, as we, we actually move into statehood. I mean, that's a question mark. What happens in an independent Puerto Rico? Well, in theory, we know we would have our fiscal authority, we would have monetary policy, trade policy, but we do not know what sort of relationship we would have with the U.S. We don't, we don't know whether we will have free trade agreement or bilateral investment treaties, tax treaties. I mean, those are open-ended questions. I mean, I would be speculating, right, if I were to tell you a definite answer. With regards to the French territories, however, as you might know, I mean, Yes, the French, pursuant to their constitutional system, define the French Polynesia, New Caledonia, and Reunion, and San Bartz, and all these jurisdictions as domes. Mm -hmm. But in reality, two years ago, the United Nations actually took the French Poly Polynesia back into the list of colonies. Mm -hmm. So pursuant to international law, they are colonial territories, pursuant to French law, there's something different. I mean, they're in the midst now of actually holding a plebiscite next year. Right? So, I mean, in a way, they are more advanced than we are in terms of the process because they have a timetable moving forward, which actually we do not have. Now, in terms of Peggy, she raises a rather straightforward, great question, territory or colony. That reminds me of Hernandez Colon's thesis. Uh, actually, pursuant to US constitutional law, we are a territory. But in reality, we are a colony. <coughs> The nuances that the founding fathers, you mentioned Hamilton, you mentioned Jefferson, those folks hated the word colony. So if you look at the US Constitution, at no point the founding fathers actually included the word colony. So the euphemism, right, the semantic twist, instead of using colonies, they use territory. But for practical purposes, it's the same, right? So we are obviously pursuant to US constitutional law and unincorporated territory, subject to Congress plenary authority, and under international law, we are covering, right? 
right? And then, obviously, my esteemed mentor, Professor Diaz Quinones, raises the whole question of, you know, this is a policy issue. Yes, it is. Because there has been a shift in American thought in terms of what to do with Puerto Rico. During the Cold War, the US under Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, those folks, with Henry Cabot Lodge, and Mason Sears, and Francis Bolton at the United Nations, uh, they were fond of saying that Puerto Rico had achieved a new dimension in US federalism, that we were fully self-governing, that basically there was a compact between Puerto Rico and the US. And that was at the height of the Cold War, when MacArthur was fighting the Chinese, when all of a sudden you had McCarthy just in the US chasing away communists, when you had Khrushchev uh, replacing Stalin at the Kremlin at the height of the Cold War. So you had to come up with an anti-colonial discourse, and that's what happened. Now the Cold War is finished. Puerto Rico is no longer necessary in terms of military, uh, strategic, uh, uh, conventional warfare as it was. And in terms of policy, the US has decided we're going to treat these folks differently. The US did the same thing with the Indian tribes. <coughs> the US have been negotiating with the Indian tribes on the basis of treaties between 1787 and 1877, and all of a sudden, the US changed its policy, and it decided, for no constitutional reason whatsoever, that it wasn't going to enter into any more treaties with the Indian tribes, boom, as a matter of policy, under Ulysses Grant. I mean, that's, and that's precisely what's happening in the context of Puerto Rico. Now, <coughs> uh, there is a question uh, by, uh, there's another last question by someone who's a young lady over here who's actually saying that there are two diasporas, etc. and that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, the young folks, they don't bring the prejudices of old oh, folks in a way, and they bring a new perspective, <coughs> right, fresh, and I think that's going to be enriching. And then there's a last question by Edwin Ortiz, and he's asking what's up with the how can we transcend? And I believe that precisely this is the sort of crisis we were waiting for, in a way, to transcend. Because this is a transformative moment, mm -hmm. right? It's not just a moment to just you know, lie down in a heap and just cry and be depressed. This is the moment we're waiting for. Because now the cat is out of the bag. It's like there's a big pink elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. And we know exactly what that we need to, as Lydia is suggesting, coalesce, build consensus, have a big time conversation, the diaspora getting involved. I mean, it's wonderful to see so many folks here. I mean, I think this is one of those great moments. It's a painful moment, but it's a great moment nonetheless. And we should actually seize this moment. Thank you. Thank you. We're out of time. <laughs> Thank you.